Last time, we saw the case made for the philosopher kings, the case made for the superior rights of wisdom and virtue to rule the city. But then we also saw that the virtues, and indeed the way of life of philosophers, seem to be utterly unpolitical, oriented towards something that transcends political concerns and that gives philosophers uh, a preference for private life, not public service. And so the relationship of the philosophers to the city is still in some question. Why would philosophers want to be kings, even if we need them? And the very possibility of the city has actually been called into doubt, because if the existence of philosopher kings is what makes the city possible, that presumes that somehow there could be a city that would be willing to accept philosophers as kings. But who would accept these guys as rulers? It's not shown that anyone would. In this pair of lessons, we're going to look at Socrates' discussion of how to educate someone to become a philosopher, someone with philosophic potential. How to turn their souls away from the goods and honors of this world towards the contemplation of being and truth. How to turn their soul especially toward what Socrates calls the idea of the good, which is somehow the first principle of all reality. Now, this discussion does have a political rationale. If the regime they've described is the best possible regime, and if it requires philosopher kings, then it is, in a sense, a political task to figure out how to produce these philosopher kings for the sake of the city. In other words, philosophy is still, in a way, being treated as a means to realizing the political ideal that the best regime represents. But as we'll see in the course of discussing the education of the philosopher, it, it becomes crystal clear to Glaucon that philosophy or the philosophic life is good in its own right and in fact is of superior dignity to that of the city. Now this discussion of the education of the philosopher contains some very famous Platonic images. The image of the sun, the image of the divided line, and the allegory of the cave, which is itself an image of the movement from ignorance to wisdom. And this allegory is uh, somewhat of a shocking one because it presents the human condition as a condition of deep ignorance and even slavery, deep alienation from the truth. And it's a condition that only a rare few can escape. This brings a somewhat bleak view of the human condition, I think, although it also sharpens the sense of the need to escape, to become truly educated. In the process of the discussion of the philosophic education, we are also introduced to what you might call the main tool of philosophy, dialectic. Um, this is a, a Greek term that means something like the art or skill of carrying on a conversation. It's the term that's usually used for what Socrates does, where you're not engaged in empirical investigation of some kind, looking under microscopes, taking things apart, putting them back together, and such things, but rather where you elicit opinions, and then you cross-examine those opinions and try to work your way towards more adequate opinions. So the art of conversation cross-examining opinions in order to overcome inconsistency, incompleteness, and ascend towards truth. And it turns out that the practice of dialectic is very dangerous. So dangerous, in fact, that Socrates says nobody under the age of 30 should be exposed to it. That's something quite different from what Socrates himself actually did. But so, now we'll look at the philosophic education. And it begins with the discussion of what Socrates calls the greatest study, the idea of the good. Somehow, apprehension of the idea of the good is the ultimate goal and the consummation of the education in philosophy. It is the first principle. 
Now, in his discussion of this, Socrates is very explicit in saying, once again, that what I am about to say is not a truly adequate account. It is only a sketch. You remember in the discussion of the soul, he said, what we're doing here is not fully adequate. It's not fully precise. It's just a sketch, but there's another longer way around that one must go in order to understand the soul properly. Well, now, Socrates says that other longer way around is the pursuit of the knowledge of the good. But he won't provide that. Instead, he provides images and suggestions. So again, we see that as we reach one of the most important parts of the Republic, Socrates quite explicitly tells us that what he is giving us here is not philosophy pure and simple, but it's something preparatory and sketchy. It might provide some guidance, but it's not adequate in its own right. And we as readers, as individuals, would have to go further in order to follow up the train of thought that Socrates is proposing here. But so, he begins by talking about the greatest study, which is the consummation of the philosophic education. And it is the idea of the good. Here is what he says. And at this point, he's still speaking with Adamantus. He says, you have many times heard that the idea of the good is the greatest study, and that it is by availing oneself of it, namely the good, along with just things and the rest, that those other things become useful and beneficial. And now you know pretty certainly that I'm going to say this, and besides this, that we don't have sufficient knowledge of it. And if we don't know it, the idea of the good, and should have ever so much knowledge of the rest without this, you know that it's of no profit to us, just as there would be none in possessing something in the absence of the good. Or do you suppose it's of any advantage to possess everything except what's good? Or to be prudent about everything else in the absence of the good, while being prudent about nothing fine and good? And Adamantus says, of course not. Right? So the good is the greatest study because we cannot truly know how other things are beneficial until we know what the good itself is. How can we know what makes a good law until we know what the good is? How do we know in what sense justice is good until we know what the good is? This is his argument here. So the knowledge of the good is the guiding principle, as he suggests here, of all of our other activity, including, of course, the activity of the rulers. But, as he points out, most opinions about the good are false. He says most people, the many, think that the good consists in pleasure. But that can't be right, because they'll also admit that there are good and bad pleasures. But if there are bad pleasures, then pleasure can't simply be good. So in the same way, there are more sophisticated sorts who say, oh no, the good's not pleasure. The good consists in prudence or wisdom. But if you press those people, what they really mean is prudence not about shoemaking or wisdom about art, but wisdom about what's good. So in other words, it's circular. They say that the, that the good consists in prudence. What kind of prudence? Prudence about the good. Very well. But what is the good? We seem to be at a loss. And Socrates tries to get out of saying what the good is. But he does say, nonetheless, that even if we don't have adequate knowledge of the good, it is clear that the good is what we are always ultimately after. It's what the soul longs after. As he says, um, this, that is the good, is what every soul pursues, and for the sake of which it does everything. The soul divines that it is something, but it is at a loss about it, and unable to get a sufficient grasp of just what the good is, or to have a stable trust such as it has about other things. So the good is what every soul is after. It's what we most deeply want. It is our highest desire, the ultimate goal of all of our actions, and we don't 
know what it is. That's where we are. But philosopher kings, in order to rule, must attain knowledge of that good. But Socrates refuses to say what it is. He claims that he doesn't have adequate knowledge of it, and he also says, and even without knowledge, I'm not going to give my opinion because you all would not be able to follow it. And he says this even though Glaucon intervenes at this point, takes over for his brother saying, no Socrates, you've taken us this far, you've got to tell us something about this. Don't stop now. And so Socrates agrees to give, again, a sketch. Not an adequate account, but a sketch. I'm not going to tell you what the good is, what my opinion about what the good is, Glaucon, but I'll tell you what it's like. And with that, he offers his famous image of the sun, where the idea of the good is, in the intelligible world, analogous to the sun in the visible world. And here's how it works. You have the world of the senses, and the world of the senses is presided over by the sun. And the sun in some way provides the power that makes the world of the senses possible. Likewise, the world of the ideas, the intelligible, immaterial world, is presided over by the idea of the good. He, he spells this out a bit. We have eyes, and there are objects that we can see. But our eyes cannot see those objects unless the sun provides light whereby we can see those objects. So the sun is the source of the light that makes the visible world visible to us. And so, similarly, somehow, the idea of the good is what illuminates or makes it possible for our intellect to grasp all other ideas. The idea of the good is the source of our intellect's ability to know anything. Likewise, Socrates argues that the, the beings in the visible world could not exist without the power of the sun. He especially has in mind you know, the plant life and animal life. But without the sun, all those things would die. So in some way, the sun not only makes the visible world visible, but allows it to be, to exist. And so in the same way, the idea of the good not only makes other ideas possible to be known, but gives those ideas their very existence. And in this sense, somehow, the suggestion is that the idea, is the first, the idea of the good is the first principle of reality, the source of all other beings. It gives existence and being and intelligibility to everything else. How? He doesn't say. It's just an image. But it's what he suggests. It does suggest, however, a kind of teleological understanding of being, right? We know what something is only when we know its end, its purpose, the good that it serves or that it tends towards, right? That is perhaps one suggestion for why you would say that the first principle is the idea of the good, right, rather than the idea of being or the idea of the one. When you say that the first principle is the idea of the good, it suggests some kind of teleologically ordered cosmos, where to know what something is is to know what it is good for or what good it serves. And in a certain way, Aristotle picks up on this suggestion in his natural philosophy. Um, but another thing I want to mention about the idea of the good is the, the good is not a god. He doesn't describe it as a god. Although, if the good is the first principle, this vouchsafes the notion that we live in a cosmos that is intelligible and orderly and good. It nonetheless remains the case that the idea of the good is utterly impersonal. The idea of the good doesn't care about you. So in that sense, we have a good and orderly cosmos, but at the same time, one that is, in a personal sense, indifferent. And it's important to recognize that part of the, the perspective being suggested here by, uh, by Socrates. So the idea of the good supplies being and intelligibility to all the other ideas. 
Now, in order to put this image to work in a description of education, right, where the question is, well, how do we ascend to the ideas, Socrates introduces another image, a rather complicated one that I'm going to cover in only a uh, sketchy way. And this is the idea of the line, or the divided line, where he, he basically divides reality into kind of four sections on a divided line. The lower two sections um, represent the visible world, the upper two sections represent the intelligible world. The image of the divided line provides a kind of model of education as an ascent from lower beings to higher beings, or from lower forms of apprehending the world to more adequate ways of apprehending the world. It is a model of how to ascend from opinion to knowledge. And the basic idea here is that going up the line consists in progressively recognizing kind of higher principles that render lower principles intelligible. So for example, the world of the senses is given to us by the senses. It's just there. And we see all sorts of things in it. But we begin to understand that world more adequately when we grasp what we see with our senses in terms of certain ideas and categories. Even if we can't give an adequate account of those ideas and categories. You know, the illustration that he provides is, for example, the way that we discover that the use of the abstract principles of arithmetic and geometry help render the material world more intelligible in such a way that the material world begins to seem almost as though it's a kind of imperfect copy of the kind of regular and static shapes, relations, and quantities given to us through mathematics. So we have a kind of movement up the line from simply relying on our senses to understanding our senses in light of certain um, ideas that we can use to explain them. But to go to the very top of the line, to ascend to the ideas, is an ascent to first principles, where you don't rely, say, on deductive knowledge or um, mathematical knowledge, much less on mere opinion, but where you try to start with your opinions and work your way up to a fully adequate account of what each thing is. So instead of engaging in kind of deductive or discursive thought, you ascend to the point where your intellect can behold, as it were, first principles. And then the truly educated soul is then able to start with those first principles and then kind of move back down and understand everything else in terms of its intelligible relations to those principles. So it's a kind of way of starting from where you are and moving up to first principles so that then you can understand everything below in light of the principles you've discovered. The highest principle of which is, of course, the idea of the good. So that's the divided line. And the divided line then provides a kind of trajectory for what comes next, the famous allegory of the cave. Because up to this point, Socrates has provided kind of images of principles. What's the greatest study? The idea of the good. What's the good? Well, it's like the sun, but in the intelligible world. Well, how does it relate? Well, there's, you can think about it in terms of a line where you have lower beings and higher beings, and you try to ascend up the line. These are kind of just basic images. Then at this point, he provides a much kind of richer uh, image of the actual process of moving up the line, the process of weaning yourself from opinion and working your way up to truth. And this is presented as liberation from imprisonment within a cave. And it's worth stopping to note at this point that with the introduction of the allegory of the cave, this discussion of education begins to become very political again. So you might note Plato has done something, or Socrates has done something rather strange, right? The greatest study is the idea of the good, and the reason why, which he initially suggests, is because the good is the ultimate goal of all of our action, of all of our doing. The idea of the good is presented as, as a kind of practical objective that guides our action. And since the rulers are practical men, they'll have to know the idea of the good in order to do their jobs. But then once he starts actually providing images to describe the good, he shifts in a way from talking about practical matters to talking about metaphysics and epistemology, right? Because this idea of the good becomes this impersonal first principle of being and intelligibility. All of a sudden, it seems utterly divorced from practical action of any kind. You can't possess the idea of the good. 
So what's going on here? Well, with the cave allegory, we begin to move our way back down to practical activity. Although I think you can kind of see what Socrates is up to, even though he doesn't say it, which is that he's saying everybody wants the good. People do not know what the good is. And the only people who know what the good is are the philosophers who are utterly devoted to the pursuit of truth for its own sake. And that somehow is the real good, even though that's not what most people are striving for. Most people are striving for other things that they conceive of as good, but it's in part because they are unaware of the whole dimension of reality that gives a true meaning to what we're doing. Something like that. But now, as I said, the allegory of the cave begins to become very political. Because he says, we are going to give an image of our nature both in its education and in its lack of education. And he asks Leochon to imagine prisoners in a cave below the earth in chains. They cannot turn around or stand up. They can only face the back wall of the cave. Far, far back behind them, the cave is open to the outside, but it's very, very far away, and they're utterly unaware of it. They're utterly unaware of anything other than what they see in the cave. They are chained, and they face the wall, and behind them, there is a kind of road with high walls, and behind that, there is a fire burning. And this fire, this artificial light, is the source of almost all the light that's actually in the cave. And there are these mysterious people who pass back and forth on the road behind this partition. And as they pass, they hold up various images or artifacts of, of animals and other natural beings and of human beings and of human artifacts. They hold up these kind of copies of various things. And what they hold up casts a shadow on the wall that the prisoners are looking at. So they see all these shadow shapes going by. And because they cannot turn around, because they are unaware of anything other than what they see on the wall, they think that those shadows are reality. They think that those are the real thing. And that's life in the cave. Now, this is a strange image. I want to stop here before I move to the next part of it, because there's already some, you could say, good news and some bad news implied in this depiction of the human condition. The good news is that Socrates is, is suggesting that we do have some kind of connection with reality. The cave is not utterly sealed underground. There is a path out. The bad news is that it seems that the human condition is almost as far from the truth as you can possibly be. That we are, as it were, by nature, born alienated from the truth. Such that in this image, education becomes an image of liberation from the cave. To be educated doesn't just mean to learn stuff, it means to escape from prison and to recognize how alienated you've been from the truth. Now I'll return in a moment to this question of why Socrates thinks that we are so far away from the truth, right? Because he says these men in the cave believe that the truth is nothing but these shadows of artificial things. They see shadows on the wall cast by artifacts being held by these mysterious puppet masters in front of a fire. And that's what they take to be reality. They're like three steps removed. Why? Well, we'll come back to that in a little bit. But let's look at, the, that's the image of lack of education. Let's look at the image of education. Socrates says, now suppose there's somebody in the cave who goes around and he releases one of the prisoners, liberates him, and stands him up, and turns him around, and forces him to look at the fire, and to answer questions about it, and about these artifacts being held up. And he says, this will be very unpleasant. Right? This prisoner who's been imprisoned all his life, he'll be dazzled by the light, he'll be blinded by the light, he'll be angry and annoyed at this person who's bothering him by standing him up and blinding him. It'll be an extremely unpleasant process. But let's say that this liberator, whoever he is, goes further and actually drags this released prisoner up and out of the cave and leaves him outside. Well, at first, 
this liberated prisoner is going to be miserable because he is utterly blind. He's never been in the daylight. He's not going to be able to see anything. But then over time, first by looking at shadows or reflections in the water and gradually being able to lift his gaze, he'll begin to see the world around him. And as his eyes get stronger and he gets used to where he is, he will um, look around and actually begin to look up and see all the beings and the sky and the stars, and eventually he will be able to see the sun itself. And then he'll recognize and he'll realize that everything he knew before was a lie, was artificial, and that now he sees how things really are. And instead of being annoyed and vexed, he will be extremely grateful to the man who liberated him, because now he's in touch with reality. And not only will he be grateful, but he'll be so happy that he will have nothing but pity for those who are still in the cave, which just recently had been him. He will look down on the cave in the sense that he will no longer value the knowledge, the supposed knowledge that people have in the cave. He will no longer care about the honors that are given out in the cave. He would rather be dead than go back down into that cave, back down into that prison. And Socrates says, and if he did, a strange thing would happen. Because in the same way that it's blinding to move from darkness into light, it's also blinding to move from light back into darkness. So if this person were to be brought back down into the cave, at first he would be a very strange experience, sight for everyone else there. He wouldn't make any sense anymore. He wouldn't be able to see what they see. He wouldn't talk about the shadows the way they talked about. In other words, they would think that whoever that guy was that liberated this person and took him out of the cave has corrupted him because before he was normal and now he's a weirdo. And if they can, Socrates says, the other cave dwellers would seize the person who had liberated this cave dweller and would kill him. Clearly, anybody who knows anything about Socrates sees that this is an image of Socrates, in a way. This liberator who gets people out of the cave is Socrates. The initially unpleasant and vexing way that he does it is through dialectical cross-examination, whereby people are forced to think about their opinions for the first time and don't like doing that and don't like being contradicted. And when some people become converted to the philosophic way of life by Socrates, other people around them think that Socrates has corrupted them, has turned them, turned them towards a useless or corrupt way of life. And of course, we know that Socrates was ultimately executed by Athens for corrupting the youth. So this mysterious liberator in the cave is, is no one other than Socrates himself. And the means of liberation is dialectic. But Socrates draws an important conclusion from this image, or you might be better to say he uses the image to illustrate an important point, which is that education is not what people oftentimes think it is. There's a kind of popular image of education in his day and in ours that education consists in basically just sticking knowledge inside people's heads. You didn't have it before, here it is. It's like knowledge is filling up space with little knowledge bits. And Socrates says that's not education at all. Just as we have eyes, which give us the power to see, but which don't work when we're in darkness. Just so, our minds have the power to know, but what we're able to apprehend depends upon our orientation. So in the same way, if you're in darkness, the only way to begin to be able to see is to turn your body around so that your eyes can look upon things illuminated by light. Right? It's not just enough to turn your eyes, because if you're facing in the opposite direction, you're not going to be able to see it. You have to turn your whole body around towards the light so that your eyes can see. So in the same way, he says, the art of education consists in turning the whole soul around, away from becoming, away from the world of the senses, away from the cave, away from opinion, and towards apprehension of the ideas and the idea of the good. So education is the art of turning the whole soul around, as he says, from becoming towards being, from the sensible world towards the intelligible world. Why the whole soul? I think probably because of the following. We've seen this already. 
The fact that it's difficult to learn things is not the only obstacle to knowledge. There's also the fact that we have many passions and desires which guide us in life and which, which fix us and connect us to particular goods and particular things. We don't just have opinions in some kind of impartial way. We have passionate opinions about things that we care about. And those passions and desires and the opinions that support them and that arise from them can be great internal obstacles to a genuine pursuit of the truth. Because a genuine pursuit of the truth requires the willingness to subject to cross-examination every opinion we have however dear, and to reject any opinion that cannot be justified, however dear. And that is a process that is not merely intellectually difficult, but even more so, you could say, emotionally difficult. So for your intellect to apprehend the truth, your whole soul, your passions and desires must be ordered in such a way that what you care about above everything else is simply knowing the truth, regardless of what it is. That's what it means to turn the whole soul from becoming towards being. You have to be willing to let go of your previous attachments and opinions. In the next part of this lesson, I'll talk about the way that Socrates applies this image to the philosopher kings, and then we'll discuss the curriculum that potential philosopher kings will have to follow in the city and speech, and we'll conclude by looking at Socrates' final statement about how the city and speech can be founded.